Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. A battle is brewing at the State House in Trenton over proposed increases to health care premiums for public workers. And labor unions are striking back. Hundreds gathered in protest today, representing hundreds of thousands of disgruntled workers. Organizers say it's the largest in-person labor rally in the state since the start of the pandemic, though it didn't quite rival the rallies of former Governor Chris Christie's days. But the message was just as strong. The unions, along with elected officials, are urging the Murphy administration to call off a state committee vote that'll solidify that rate hike, giving leaders more time to negotiate. It's an unusual rift between the governor and the unions who helped elect him. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports from Trenton. One, two, three, four. There was some stored up public union frustration that found an outlet today in a state house rally against what could be a 20% hike in the cost of union health benefits. We have given up raises, deferred them to keep this state afloat. It is not right for them to now come after us to pay more for our health insurance. It's not right. So we're going to fight back and make sure our voices are heard. A coalition of over a dozen unions brought in close to a thousand demonstrators, representing hundreds of thousands of public workers, including over a hundred thousand teachers. The state health board is scheduled to vote tomorrow on rate increases for many of them. At University Hospital Newark, we have labored for years under a substandard health care insurance, and today we're trying to prevent that for us. So for those rate increases, we will make it even more difficult for healthcare workers to receive good health care. Imagine that, and we're working in the trenches. The state insists health care costs are up across the board, across the country. But some state lawmakers who say they were blindsided by this proposed increase suggest the administration could do more to help soften the blow, which we could all end up feeling. My greatest concern is that the bill will get passed down to boards of education, municipalities, counties, other levels of government, an impact to the public employee, an impact to that infrastructure. If, in fact, they can't hold the bill, they will turn to taxpayers to raise those sums of money to cover those rising costs. So what I was hoping for in general was a broader, robust conversation with more transparency and looking at every possible measure that we could undertake to mitigate these immediate impacts. And I'm not sure that that has happened. We were pressed for time. Treasury has stated that they have to take a vote on Wednesday, and I'm hugely disappointed with that. Luis, who says the national average is around 10 percent increases, suggests that there's $600 million in money from the so-called Horizon Conversion Fund that's supposed to help with keeping rates down, and another $200 million of unused federal COVID money that the administration could justifiably use to help lessen the impact. Governor Murphy, who owes his two terms by and large to union support, said this week that talks are ongoing and that a solution could still be reached. The union says talks are ongoing, although optimism for a negotiated settlement was lacking. Not one cent was allocated to help negate a raise in health care. Now, doesn't that sound like an economic impact caused by COVID? Sound like BS to me. That's exactly what the American Rescue Plan was made for, correct? Yeah. Instead of them turning to us and putting the burden back on us and our families again, 
they need to internalize and look at themselves. As union rallies go, this one didn't attract a lot of star power, but it was the largest show of union strength in some time, certainly since before COVID. But with the administration apparently content to let tomorrow's vote take place, it's worth asking if anyone up the street was listening. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Well, a number of issues will be influencing voters as they head to the polls for midterm elections this fall, not the least of which abortion rights and the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to overturn the landmark Roe v. Wade. Well, Democrats expect the topic could provide a boost in votes from women and abortion rights supporters, and it's a subject where Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill has long devoted her attention, last night hosting a panel with Planned Parenthood in Montclair. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas was there. How many people who, who are just a generation ahead of me, how many people had those personal stories who dealt with deaths from back alley abortions, who saw people bleeding out um, on their examination tables. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill held an event at Planned Parenthood in Montclair last night, bringing the issue of abortion access front and center in her campaign for re-election in the 11th Congressional District. Lest we all think, that here in New Jersey, we're fine, right? Oh, here in New Jersey, we have protections. Mm -hmm. I always remind people, New Jersey under Chris Christie mm -hmm. was the first state in the nation mm -hmm. to defund mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. So without these minimal baseline protections of Roe, mm -hmm. we are simply at the mercy of the ballot box. The event brought out pro-abortion supporters who are calling for federal legislation to protect abortion after the overturning of Roe, even though New Jersey has codified abortion access here in the state. Governor Murphy also recently passed two laws protecting people seeking abortion from out of state as well as the providers performing them. Two pieces of legislation that um, prohibit individuals from being extradited from New Jersey if they are um, um, subject to criminal prosecution in another state. They pro uh, prohibit public entities and public employees in the state from cooperating with civil or criminal investigations um, for abortion care provided here, and then prohibit licensing boards from taking adverse action against our um, professionals here based upon abortion care that's provided. Kay McDonald saying the legality of these state laws could be ever-changing as abortion laws continue to evolve around the nation. This area is just very much in flux, particularly legally, um, the degree to which it butts up against like the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution is very real and just very un, um, uh, very new in sort of the analysis of what can and cannot sort of pass constitutional muster. At this point, we're just really trying to do everything that we can that is legally defensible. Congresswoman Cheryl reminding the audience there has been some movement in the House of Representatives that she's supported to expand abortion access. I voted for the Women's Health Protection Act, which codifies Roe. Um, we, we're working to get more support in the Senate. Um, and then we've also um, passed legislation in the House to extend legal protections to Americans who utilize constitutional freedom to travel to another state to seek health care. We reached out to Paul DeGroot, who's running against Cheryl in the 11th District. DeGroot has reportedly said that abortion laws should be left to the states, but when we spoke with him this week, he offered no comment, saying that his position on abortion would instead be released later this week in a press release. Abortion has been a fine line for Republicans in New Jersey to walk, given that the majority of residents in the state supported Roe. But will it be enough to bring people out to the polls, especially given the low approval rating of President Biden amid rising inflation? Cheryl says yes. Here's the thing for women in New Jersey. We love New Jersey. We, we think that we have some very good laws here and we move very quickly, but we're Americans. You know, we want to know that we're going to have the freedom to travel to other places in this country, go to the pharmacy and get our contraceptives, basic stuff. Or if our lives are in danger, our health is in danger, um, that we're going to go s receive medical care that we need or um, that our friends, family, um, colleagues across the country aren't going to face travel bans or um, some sort of other reduction of rights. It's a message she hopes will be enough to drive voters out to the polls this election season. In Montclair, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News.
And for a deeper dive into the District 11 matchup, check out Colleen O'Day's reporting at njspotlightnews.org. While you're there, click on the NJ Decides 2022 tab so you can keep up with everything you need to know heading into the fall elections, including whether you're registered to vote and who's running in your district. Well, some commuters faced a daunting drive into work this morning with a number of roads hit by flash flooding caused by overnight storms. Flooding has become an all too familiar scenario in New Jersey, especially for homeowners. But new federal data shows more than 12,000 policyholders in the state have dropped their flood insurance after a federal program raised their premiums. The new policy is called Risk Rating 2.0, run by FEMA, and it's raised rates on roughly 8 out of 10 New Jersey homeowners with federal flood insurance, while about 20 percent of those with the policy saw rates drop. Although stats have since been pulled from FEMA's website, the agency says the numbers are being checked for accuracy. Government leaders, though, are still struggling to deal with this issue, especially as climate change intensifies flooding and those once in a hundred year storms like Tropical Storm Ida. New Jersey's Department of Community Affairs Monday night held its second and final public hearing, gathering input on how the state should spend more than $228 million in federal aid to help families hit by that storm. And they got an earful. Ted Goldberg has the story. Libre Jones owned her Newark home for just seven months when it was hit by Tropical Storm Ida. To see water coming out of the toilet and out of the sink that you can't stop is one issue. To have water coming in from the street that you also can't stop. We had sub pumps. We had two. They failed. Jones's basement flooded with two feet of water. Her family had to buy new pumps and work for 12 hours to drain it. We lost photos. We lost at least the first three years of our son's photos and art projects and other things. We lost other things. We lost furniture. We lost sound system. But for me, being the mom, losing those baby pictures, major. FEMA and flood insurance sent her payments, but not enough to cover all of the damages. Jones was one of the many Ida survivors expressing frustration at Monday's public hearing with the Department of Community Affairs. As the state puts together a plan to spend more than $228 million in federal relief. State officials estimate that's about 60% of what's really needed. How much more fighting do you have to do? How block you literally could have put a boat out there and just waddled in the water. It was so much water. But why should we have to fight so hard? So still following up with FEMA, they told me that an investigator had already came, closed my case. No one had even been to my house. I'm now facing almost a $250,000 bill from my landscaper to redo my driveway, my landscaping. The town knows I hired a lawyer. I have an engineer. They have done nothing to help me because I am not socially vulnerable. I want to know what programs you have in place for people who don't have the need per se, but don't have the money to do this. The federal funds will be spent on things like hazard mitigation, as well as raising homes on stilts and buying out homeowners in flood prone areas. Some residents say another solution is to stop building homes in areas susceptible to floods. Earlier this year, the DEP proposed rules to do just that, but they've been stalled after pushback from the construction industry. We can no longer build smartly in flood prone areas. Our town or our city um, does not even want to take an inventory of who has been affected. Why do we keep building those places? Because builders make money doing it. They make money putting people in harm's way. And our rules allow them to do it. In fact, even encourage them to do it. Um, and they buy there because they can't afford to buy anywhere else. From what she saw and heard yesterday, Jones is optimistic about the state's plan. I'm hopeful. I, I like a lot of things that I did see in the plan. If there is mitigation from structures in the area, from the county, to kind of help move that water, like a, a real professional look, a deep dive at what causes the backup. The climate change is climate change. There's nothing we're going to be able to do about these more powerful storms. But what can the structures do? What can the private institutions do? 
That's the $228 million question facing the state of New Jersey one year after Ida. This was the second and final public hearing, but public comment is still open until Friday. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. It's official. The Gateway Development Commission is now in charge of the proposed Hudson Tunnel project that will build a new commuter rail tunnel linking New Jersey to New York under the Hudson River. It's a bureaucratic step that transfers responsibility of the project from the Port Authority to the bi-state agency created to oversee the plans. But it's also considered a critical step, enabling the commission to apply for federal grants and loans. The commission held its first public hearing today since announcing the Gateway Tunnel project would be delayed by another three years and cost $2 billion more than last year's estimates. The head of the organization today said federal funds could greatly reduce that price tag and members are already working to apply for that help. Economists had high hopes, but a disappointing reality set in with today's inflation report. Rhonda Schaffler has the details, plus tonight's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, you'd think we get used to bad news on the inflation front, but today's report was unnerving and prompted an early sell-off on Wall Street. The Consumer Price Index showed an uptick in August. Over the past year, inflation has increased 8.3%. Food, shelter, and medical costs all went up last month. Economists thought inflation would drop in August because gas prices have been falling, but those falling prices offset by the costs of so many other goods still rising in price. Ride-sharing company Uber has paid New Jersey $100 million after the state said the company misclassified its drivers as independent contractors. A state audit concluded that Uber improperly classified hundreds of thousands of drivers and the company failed to make required contributions into the Unemployment Trust Fund. State Labor Commissioner Robert Acero Angelo explains workers lose their rights when they are misclassified. When someone's misclassified as an independent contractor, they lose their rights to a minimum wage, to overtime, to the ben to unemployment benefits, temporary disability, family leave insurance, equal pay, earned sick, uh, on and on. Any employment-related benefits are generally lost when someone is misclassified as an independent contractor. The commissioner says rooting out worker misclassification will continue to be a priority for the Murphy administration. The Uber case is the largest such payment ever received in New Jersey. The state has received another credit rating upgrade. Fitch has upped its rating on New Jersey's general obligation debt and continues to hold a positive outlook. This is the first time Fitch has upgraded New Jersey's debt since it started rating the state back in 1992. This is also the third credit rating upgrade for New Jersey in the past year. The whistleblower who revealed security lapses at the social media company Twitter testified before Congress today. Peter Mudge Zatko described widespread security failures and vulnerabilities. To put it bluntly, Twitter leadership ignored its, ignored its engineers because key parts of leadership lacked the competency to understand the scope of the problem. But more importantly, their executive incentives led them to prioritize profits over security. Twitter has denied this. The testimony came on the same day Twitter shareholders voted to approve Elon Musk's bid to buy the company. Now let's take a look at those closing numbers from Wall Street. I'm Rhonda Schaffler and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Ukrainian forces are making dramatic advances on the battlefield, pushing the Russian army to retreat from several villages in the hard-hit northeastern Kharkiv region, enabling Ukraine to recapture about 2,000 square miles of territory from the invading Russian military. 
signaling a potential turning point in the six-month-old war. But allies have been careful not to declare a premature victory. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is vowing to continue the counterattack until his country reclaims all of its territory. The recent gains represent about 10 percent of the land Russia has seized since the start of the attack in February. Meanwhile, the Kremlin this week insisted it won't back down either, promising to, quote, achieve its goals in Ukraine. But the recent defeat for Russian troops is sparking rare criticism of Russian President Vladimir Putin, with elected officials there now calling for his resignation. For insight on how all of this could play out, we turn, as we often do, to Alan Sanders, St. Peter's University Professor Emeritus of Political Science. Professor Sanders, I think back to the early days of this war when Russian officials said that they would have this uh, wrapped up within days, that Ukraine's government uh, would fall. It hasn't. Now we're seeing some significant momentum on the side of Ukrainian forces. What, if anything, should we make of that? Is this the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I don't think it's the light at the end of the tunnel because we're in here for a uh, long-term kind of conflict. Uh, but what it really shows is that uh, Mr. Putin and his generals made some strategic miscalculations. They underestimated uh, the resolve of the Ukrainians to defend their territory and their independence. Uh, they miscalculated on the uh, the West's response and the unity that uh, the invasion would create among NATO allies. Um, and they, I think, underestimated uh, their own military capacity. Uh, their uh, ammunition, their weapon systems, sure. and the morale of their troops. Well, it's interesting, even the Russian state media now has been, I wouldn't go so far as to say critical um, of, of President Putin, but certainly um, acknowledging that some defeats have happened. Are there political consequences here now for him? Well, I think there are huge political consequences. Uh, that is to say, I don't think anything is going to be imminent. But again, in the long term, uh, Mr. Putin has been trying to show an aura of invincibility, political invincibility and military invincibility. But now there are cracks that are showing, both in the hawkish factions of uh, the Kremlin, but also in the more dovish uh, sections of uh, the Kremlin and the uh, regime. And so while nothing is imminent, nonetheless, these cracks risk uh, getting greater and broader. And that is a danger for Mr. Putin's regime. Well, I mean, even beyond uh, cracks, as you put it, you've got elected officials in Russia now actually going on the record signing this petition up to 50 um, when I checked just prior to us talking now um, folks uh, who have signed on to this petition for him to resign could that spell perhaps a swifter end to this war so it's hard to really judge uh, but clearly what is uh, percolating up to him is that there are those cracks and if there are those cracks that poses a danger which means that he would have to uh, divert resources um, to try and patch up those cracks uh, and it also has to come up with some sort of strategy or some sort of development on the military front to try and silence uh, those uh, signs of dissent are we any closer to the possibility of a diplomatic settlement here? Well, any gains that Ukraine makes are, of course, useful for a diplomatic solution. But we have to remember that Mr. Putin made some rather broad claims at the outset, and he has to come up with some way to um, get off, get an off ramp that will allow him to claim some sort of victory. Right now, he doesn't have any real off ramp. And so it's hard to imagine that he would uh, be willing to sit down for negotiations at this time. Also, one other very important element that we should take note of, um, you know, Mr. Putin is betting on the tiredness of the West. We tend to be an impatient group of nations, and we like to see immediate results. So he is uh, betting that on the long term, the West will sort of abandon, quietly abandon Ukraine. Uh, so these victories on the battlefield right now are important for raising the morale of the Ukrainians, but also for raising the morale of the West mm -hmm. as it heads into a winter. And particularly in Europe, that winter will mean, mean some serious energy problems and shortages. Yeah. So all of this is important uh, for the morale of the Ukrainians, morale of the uh, West, and of course, um, puts Mr. Putin in a kind of a bind right now. It's a, it's a really good point that you make there, uh, as you often do, Professor Alan Sanders for us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care.
Well, food banks and charities across the state say they've got a short-term solution for the mountains of reusable grocery bags piling up in your home. Donate them. Places like the Community Food Bank of New Jersey report being desperate for the bag donations as they continue to help a rising number of families in need. It's a surge that began at the start of the pandemic. Well, the organization launched a website where people in northern and southern New Jersey can donate clean, like new, reusable bags at any one of their 300 pantries and distribution centers. Fulfill Food Bank, which helps Monmouth and Ocean Counties, is also accepting bag donations. And representatives from the Food Bank of South Jersey say they're in need of reusable bags in good condition for locations in Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, and Salem counties. As part of New Jersey's recent law banning single-use plastic and paper bags, food banks were given an extension until November 4th to make the switch just before the holiday season. Well, the bill's sponsor, Senator Bob Smith, says he's working on an amendment to that law that would allow the use of paper bags under some circumstances. And that's going to do it for us tonight. But make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and follow us on social media to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venosi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.